This will be a brief introduction to John Stuart Mill's classic essay, On Liberty, published in 1859. Here, Mill attempts to delimit the proper scope of human liberty in a just society, as well as the required limitations of government in the interference of the lives of its citizens. Mill's essay is regarded by many as the classic defense of the freedoms that a liberal and free society protects and the moral requirement against paternalistic governments. So we begin with the harm principle, which reads as follows. That principle is the sole end for which mankind are warranted, individually or collectively, in interfering with the liberty of action of any of their number is self-protection that the only purpose for which power can rightfully be exercised over any member of a civilized community against his will is to prevent harm to others. His own good, either physical or moral, is not a sufficient warrant. Let's think of this as a law of laws, rather the moral law on the basis of which we evaluate existing civil laws, which inevitably restrict the rights and liberties of the people that are subject to them, Mill is here announcing a criterion for the adequacy of a civil or public law, such that a civil law is only morally adequate if it corresponds to or satisfies the harm principle. So now we ask, well, what's required in order to satisfy the harm principle and thus to be an adequate law? Notice there's two important things here. Uh, we can say that a government is warranted in interfering in the behavior of its citizens when their behavior brings harm to another. Of utmost importance here is that the harm brought is to someone else other than the person performing the action. Mill says, and this might seem kind of odd, that we must retain the right and liberty to harm ourselves. The only time that government is warranted in interfering is when harm is brought to somebody else. You may rightfully wonder why it would be so important for government to allow people to harm themselves. Um, why does Mill make such a big deal about that? This is where the idea of paternalism comes into play. Uh, so long as your behavior only affects yourself, that is your right to live according to the way that you see fit, to pursue your own good in your own way, even if that brings harm to you, that appears to accord with how you, at least at that moment, see fit to live. And that's what freedom and autonomy is, to pursue your own good in your own way, so long as you're doing so, doesn't bring harm to somebody else. Should you bring harm to yourself in the process, it is absolutely your right to do so. Should you bring harm to others in the process, that is not your right to do so. The government is warranted in interfering with your behavior and stopping it through whatever means necessary, including punishment, or Mill also refers to the disapprobation of society. So in order for the harm principle to be useful at this point, uh, we would need to distinguish between self-regarding actions and other regarding actions, the former being self-regarding, just those that just affect yourself. The other regarding actions are actions that affect others. Clearly we need to make a principal distinction between these two types of actions if we are to make any sense or use of the harm principle, because the whole point is to allow you to harm yourself but not others, thus we need to clearly distinguish these two types of actions. This is where things get a little complicated. Uh, suppose I bring harm to myself through, let's say, hang gliding, and render myself incapable of exercising my duty to see fit to my family's well, see to my family's well-being, or to perform the duties of my job. In harming myself, have I also harmed others, my family, or those that depend on me at work? Since I'm because I've harmed myself, I'm now unable to do these things. So would that be a self-regarding action or an other-regarding action? Mill introduces another helpful distinction here between a contingent harm and a concrete harm. A contingent harm is an action that sometimes brings harm to another. A concrete harm is an action that always brings harm to another. How about an example here? A 
example of a concrete harm, uh, as brutal as this may sound, uh, would be, for example, um, beating somebody's head with a baseball bat. Uh, that is always and in itself harmful to the person receiving the beating. An example of a contingent harm is one that Mill himself uses of a person prone to excessive drink. Uh, that is sometimes harmful to others, sometimes not. Should the person drinking to excess be what we call an angry drunk, then in such a condition their, drink, their excess will lead to harm to others. But should the person in question be what we might call a friendly drunk, then without any other special conditions here, their excess really just brings harm to themselves, harm to their health, harm to any other part of their life, but just to themselves. We may suppose further that the friendly drunk does not have a, any care of dependents who require him to see to their own well-being and so on and so forth. So we can see in that case, really, he's just harmed himself. So, getting back to the distinction between a self-regarding and other-regarding action, the self-regarding action may include, will, will include the category of contingent harms and things that don't harm others at all. So, it will include actions such as drunkenness, which sometimes bring harm to others, but most importantly, sometimes don't. That will be a contingent harm and that is the kind of harm that the government must allow you to visit upon yourself, even though it sometimes harms others. We'll get back to this in a moment. The concrete harm, such as beating somebody with a baseball bat, is going to be an other regarding action, and that is the kind of action that the government is warranted in interfering in your life and stopping you from doing it, passing laws, penalizing you for engaging in such conduct, and so on and so forth. Going back to the contingent harm, uh, we might wonder, well, what about the case of drunkenness with the angry drunk? That will bring harm to others. So Mill seems to be saying that drunkenness should be allowed, tolerated, we might say, seeing fully well that sometimes that leads to harm brought to other people. So what do we do then? Well, Mill, I think, is pretty clear on this. Once the harm is brought to another person from a man's drunkenness, they begin fighting or driving, for example, then we step in. When there is a concrete harm that results from the activity of drunkenness, at that point we interfere, at that point you've done something wrong, but Mill wants to say that drunkenness in and of itself should not be prevented seeing as though there are on many occasions it can be harmful only to oneself and not to others when it is harmful to others we intervene once the harm is actually visited upon somebody so now we can ask the very straightforward question of pornography uh, as to whether or not it belongs in the category of contingent or concrete harms is pornography in and of itself harmful or is it harmful only in certain conditions and not others? For Mill, that seems to be the important distinction that we need to make. Interestingly, the same questions arise with respect to hate speech. Is that a contingent harm or a concrete harm? And what shall we say the status of that is with respect to laws and punishment? It appears to me that hate speech is going to be a contingent harm. When a person uses the n-word, for example, that can only be a vehicle of harm because many others in the past have used that word and the term has a linguistic history that goes well beyond what that person says on that particular occasion. Moreover, the harm is somewhat preventable should a person have a thick skin or simply find a way to not be bothered by the slur. I'm in no way endorsing hate speech, don't get me wrong, but it looks to me like on Mill's framework it would qualify as a contingent harm and thus something that we must be allowed to do. In his closing words, he says, Mankind are greater gainers by suffering each other to live as seems good to themselves than by compelling each to live as seems good to the rest. Food for thought, no doubt.